right, welcome to PBA at noon plus a few minutes. We're very <laughs> sorry we've had a couple of technical glitches. I've lost power at my place. I'm on my phone today for the first time. So I'm joined by my colleague, Sophie Caesar, who you can see. As you well know, we like to keep it interesting here at PBA. So we have a slightly different format today. Joining us is Peter Clausey. He's the CEO at Cobalt, CBLT Inc., a Canadian mineral exploration company targeting cobalt and gold in ethical, traceable, reliable mining jurisdictions. Cobalt trades on the venture under the symbol CBLT. Peter is here today to talk to us about the recent executive order signed by Donald Trump addressing the threat to the domestic supply chain of critical minerals and how it impacts critical metals globally. Uh, welcome, Peter, uh, and please feel free to uh, ask some questions during the presentation because there's going to be no slideshow. So anybody out there that wants a question, just te uh, text it into Sophie and she'll bring them up right away. Thanks so Thank much. You. And Peter, go ahead. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be back in Montreal, even if only virtually. <laughs> uh, I miss coming and seeing you guys and everybody on the team. So this will have to do instead. Um, there will be political overtones to today's discussion because you can't have this discussion without political overtones. So for anybody who gets offended, call me later and complain. It's not Paul's fault. Or call Sophie. Blame Sophie. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, today we're talking about Trump's order on September 30th this year uh, on critical metals and their supply chain in the United States and what it means for its safety. Now, if we start the year before, the Secretary of the Interior posted a list of 35 metals it deemed to be critical to the United States security and economic prosperity. Now, it's easy to beat up on all the policy wonks in Washington and Ottawa, but this one they got right. A country cannot be economically prosperous and secure if it relies on its foreign adversaries for the very minerals it needs to create that economy. So, the final list put out last year includes, here we go, aluminum, antinomy, arsenic, pyrite, beryllium, bismuth, cesium, chromium, all the rare earths, cobalt, and goes tantalum, tin, tungsten, zirconium, and vanadium. What's interesting isn't so much as what's on the list, as, as Sophie asked me earlier, what's not on the list. There are two metals missing from that list that are bizarre, gold and copper. Every study says that if we're going to greenify the world, we need a lot more copper. Just as a simple example, the average Tesla S uses about 85 kilograms of copper from the harness to the wiring. The average fossil fuel car uses about 50 kilograms. So on that simple metric, if we're building 4 million electric cars, we're going to need 35 extra kilograms of copper per car. You do the math in the face of mining, having a drop off in the production of copper. It's commonly called the copper cliff. We're consuming more than we're finding. Gold has a similar problem. Gold is so conductive, it's used in the electrification of the world. Can anybody name me the last major gold find in the world? The last 10 million ounce find. Five million ounces? <laughs> exactly. Now, it might be happening up at American Creek's property in the Golden Triangle in North BC. We don't know yet. It's possible. But the point is, we're consuming the resources far faster than we're finding them. And that has a critical impact on your daily life. So let's go back then to Trump's order. Uh, and whether you agree or disagree with all the things he's done to date, and I clearly fall on the disagree side, his order on September 30 was probably the best thing he's done as president. Rather, most executive orders, if you read them, are vague. You know, they're motherhood and milk statements. Oh, let's try to be nice to each other. Oh, you know, they're soft. This one has specific timelines with specific responsibilities assigned to specific people within the government. And the first timeline is October 30. There has to be a report back on his desk from the Department of Defense as to what critical middles they think they need going forward. That's before the election. So this executive order, and at the end of this, Paul and Sophie will send around a link to it, will have a dramatic impact on the production of those 35 critical metals, and incidentally on copper and gold as well. 
and it'll probably pull up silver as well, although with silver's rise to, what is it today, 25 bucks an ounce, silver should do just fine on its own without government intervention. So why are these metals so important? Well, let's, let's start with manganese. Uh, Willie, do you have a question? That popped up on my screen too. Yeah. Uh, let's hear. Hi, Willie, you can go ahead. It was more of an observation than um, a, a question. Sukai log in Russia has just been expanded from 37 million ounces to 67 million ounces. Okay, good. I hadn't heard that. That's gold. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay. Good. Thank you. So um, let's talk about uranium. We'll start there. Roughly 5% of the uranium consumed by the United States is produced in the United States. So apart from nuclear energy, and apart from any nuclear power used in hospitals, the United States has an entire fleet of ships that are nuclear powered. Now, those are small volume, low enriched uranium with long core lives. Uh, they refuel every 10 years or so. So it's not as though the ships are just going to be drifting out at sea and, and uh, diving under the water. But at some point, they have to come back to an American port to be refueled. 95% of the United States uranium is imported. Canada supports about 20%. Some comes from uh, uh, Gambia, I believe. And a fair bit comes from Russian controlled areas and China. So you want to ground the nuclear fleet? You just tighten the screws on the uranium supply. Similar problem happens with manganese. The United States is a net importer of manganese with the majority of it coming from China. And as almost everybody on the call will know, mang manganese's primary use is as a steel additive. It makes steel stronger. You want to cripple the United States steel industry? Stop shipping manganese to the United States. <laughs> It's really that simple. So some people might be asking, well, why hasn't anyone done this before? Well, I point you back to the, the uh, gosh, where did it go? There's an island whose name I can never pronounce. And there was a collision there in 2010 between a Chinese trawler and a Japanese warship. And the Japanese warship grabbed the captain of the trawler and held him in captivity. China did nothing. The world went, that's kind of unusual. But the supply of rare earths from China to Japan started to trickle down. Ah. Yeah. And miraculously, <laughs> without linking the two things, the trawler captain was released and sent back to China with an I'm sorry. So it has happened before, and it will happen again while we're talking about rare earths. China is the producer of roughly, depending how you count it, 70% of the world's rare earths, but they control 95% of the processing. We had mountain pass in the United States, um, but China's low labor cost, low processing cost and higher grade put mountain pass, plus a fair bit of incompetence, put mountain pass out of business. There was no producer of rare earths in North America. China processes 95% of the rare earths in the world. Why do we need rare earths? Well, if we're gonna electrify the world, numbers 59 and 60 on the periodic table are vital to the creation of a stable magnet, a permanent magnet. Without permanent magnets, you can't greenify the world. By the way, the way greenify is a word I borrowed from an Australian friend. Um, it, it really does deliver the concept of what we're trying to do here. So to greenify the world, you need the permanent magnets. And they are on the list of the 35 metals, uh, 59 and 60, designated by the Deputy Interior as necessary to the nation's security and economic well-being. Peter? Yeah. Uh, just to interrupt for a second. Do you think that, is, is the U.S. going to go to a system because of these strategic metals? Are they going to have something like a stockpile system where they have oil reserves and they have certain like basic stocks? Are they, are they going towards this? They have some stockpiles. Not a lot. Much of the stockpiles have been consumed and depleted. Just poor planning, and some would 
say the, the American mindset of we'll always be able to get what we want. Does, so, he, agree, does the agreement or like does, does his executive uh, order, executive order uh, bring this into play that they're going to start stockpiling some of this stuff? The executive order calls on five different ministry or uh, secretaries within the U.S. government to deliver recommendations, schedules, and very, very specific goals to achieve national security and economic prosperity. No doubt stockpiles will be part of that from all the different uh, secretaries, but as of yet, they're not part of the EO. Okay. But now I'm guessing, Peter, that um, the reason for the stockpiles would be in terms of this administration, more for, like you mentioned, national security and not greenifying uh, the country or the world. Yeah, I don't think the heart of the Republican Party really cares about climate change since it's, you know, it's not happening. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's more uh, defense. Okay. Right, appealing to that. No, the have military. You, have, Sorry, you go ahead. have you seen any evidence that uh, projects are being fast tracked in the U.S.? Like no. The not seeing that at all. In fact, you know, Idaho is such a beautiful state both visually and geologically it's very very rich geologically permitting there is a nightmare unless you happen to be lucky and you're on private lands permitting is really tough now even in arizona and uh, nevada which are some of the best jurisdictions on the planet getting your permits the first time through from blm is very difficult are there are there any agreements in place with for example the canadian government to supply metals to this, you know, strategic plan or? Um, not to supply the United States, but for itself, Canada made an interesting announcement about a month ago. The government of Saskatchewan announced it was putting $31 million into the creation of a rare earth processing plant in either Saskatoon or Regina. Now, $31 million to build a rare earth processing plant, geez, you can't even pour the foundation for that. So I was going to say, yeah. So you know more money's coming from somewhere. Then it was announced that Vital Metals out of Australia is a partner in that project. Good people at Vital Metals in Australia. So I'm interested to see how that shapes up. Northern Saskatchewan is a bounty of uh, metallurgic riches, gold and uranium and cobalt, and, um, uh, mixed bag deposits up there, polymetallics. So very curious to see what happens. But in Canada, our most advanced project was in uh, North Quebec and they ran out of money and couldn't raise more. Mm. And well, let's move over to lithium then. Yeah. Right. Everybody's looking for lithium. Now it was pointed out to me once that we know the existence and location of every solar in the world. So we already know how much lithium is in the solars. It's a bit of a mind bending concept when you think about that. What we don't know is how much lithium is in the spotamines around the world. Around Thunder Bay, there's a fair bit of lithium. Uh, Rock Tech has a nice project they're trying to put into production. I think their plan is to produce some kind of lithium concentrate and ship it to Germany for final processing. But nobody's proven they have a technology that works yet. Nobody's proven they have a process that works yet to economically extract the rare earths. Um, I see projects that have a lot of scandium in them. People go, oh, scandium, rare. Yeah. Uh, what scandium does is it, re it uh, works with aluminum to honeycomb. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a solid piece of, of aluminum, it's honeycombed, which means it has less math, mass, and more strength. Mm -hmm. So think of any industry that wants to be stronger with less mass. Automatically, airplanes come to mind. Now think about how much fuel they could conserve. The problem is there's no proven pe technology to mass scale scandium. So no end user is going to invest in it. So you can't prove the technology needed to do it on a mass scale, which means no large consumer will invest in it. It becomes a circular problem. The global market for scandium was around $60 million last year. If we could find an economic way of processing it on a mass scale, the scandium market would explode. That's one of the metals that's on the critical metals list. <clears throat> Peter, do you, do you think, I mean, what percentage of the metals is Canada very strong in? I mean, uh, is cobalt one of the better, let's speak about cobalt because it's CBLT, we want to talk about a bit as well. Uh, 
how far away are, is Canada from producing cobalt? How far away are we from producing some of the rare earths? Like, you know, they run into problems like in Northern Quebec and lithium, Alaska had trouble. So what do you think is going to happen now with this is in, this is in place in the U.S.? Is Canada going to kind of look at it and say we should be on the same page doing the same thing? I don't know if we need that national initiative. You know, the, the mining has always been more of a provincial matter. Maybe yeah. a national initiative would help. We do get the flow through funding, the flow, the, uh, the, the flow through write off, which is a massive support to Canadian based projects. Um, so I don't know if the government should be doing more or can be doing more. It'd be nice if they reduced permitting and streamlined the whole process. With but, the election so close right now in the US, I mean, and I mean, it's, let's just leave it as a toss up. I don't think it is, but let's leave it as a toss up for now. But moving forward, wouldn't this really help Canadian companies that are mining for the metals that are on that list? Well, that's the end of this conversation. What does it all mean? Yeah. How does it affect everybody on this call? But you asked about cobalt. Canada's already producing cobalt, mainly out of Sudbury um, and out of Newfoundland, I believe, but they're out of the larger copper and nickel deposits. There's only one primary cobalt mine in the world. That's in Morocco, and it produces less than half of 1% of the world's cobalt. Wow. The rest of the world's cobalt is a byproduct of copper and nickel mining. So cobalt is difficult to find in economic quantities because you have to find an economic quantity of something else to get to the cobalt. Um, you absolutely need cobalt in a greenified world. Cobalt is the metal that holds its magnetism at the highest heat. It's highly efficient. There's 12 times more cobalt in your cell phone than lithium. Uh, I was talking to somebody last week, might have been Jack Lifton, who called lithium the great pretender. Because they're <laughs> lithium ion batteries, but that's only a trick of physics. It just happens to be the metal that the ion goes back and forth from the anode, cathode, anode, cathode. Whereas there are other metals in the phone that uh, appear in greater quantity, like cobalt. The average Tesla S is going to need seven and a half kilograms of cobalt per car. Now there are very there are varying degrees of cobalt used. Uh, BVD in China uh, has a formulation of iron manganese that only uses 0.5 percent cobalt, but they still need the cobalt to make it happen. With most batteries, there's a higher percentage because it is such an efficient metal. So if we're going to greenify the world. How are we going to do that without economic quantities of cobalt? Who are we going to depend upon? Do we actually then form like a world government that takes care of mining? <laughs> there are broader scale implications here. And the United Nations hasn't been a force for anything for some time. So how do we coordinate this globally? Hey, Peter, in your opinion, then, of the, all the metals that are on the list, I mean, we have investors that are li listening into this conversation. What, in your opinion, are the top five that people should be looking at that probably have a chance of enhancing their portfolios by these stocks, like cobalt, for example. Is there a short squeeze on cobalt globally? No, cobalt has been flat to trending upwards for the past year and a half. It's a highly manipulated market controlled again by China. They can, because China controls most of Africa, they control the cobalt production. 65% of cobalt production comes from the DRC. Now that poor country's had the hell beat out of it for a hundred years since Leopold the Butcher showed up and they, they showed up for the mining wealth. It's estimated there's $24 trillion of economic wealth in the ground in the Congo. It is both that country's blessing and its curse. So 65% of the world's cobalt is going to come out of the Congo alone, get shipped over the big red wall to China and go somewhere. Which is why um, uh, Lance Hooper runs a company called Cobalt Crypto, I believe, where they're trying to introduce a Ethereum cryptocurrency tracer on Cobalt out of conflict areas so that end users like Apple and Volkswagen can be sure that their end product was ethically sourced, just like ethically sourced coffee. Right. It's an interesting idea. I haven't yet looked under the hood to see how well it works, but it's a really interesting idea. So Paul, as to your question about the top five metals, it's not so much the metals as where are the opportunities going to arrive? If this executive order is all about controlling supply chain, then you have to look at the entire supply chain 
And a company like Cobalt Crypto fits in there because it, go ahead. I'm sorry, we have a question here from uh, Peter Johnson. Peter, are you there? Unmute, I'm unmuted. You are unmuted. Am I still you. muted or unmuted? No, you're good, we can hear you. Okay. Hey, uh, my question is with regard to Cobalt in Canada, the NECO project by Fortune. They've been developing that for, I don't know, 10 years now. And they're producing a substantial amount of Cobalt, uh, 82.3 million pounds of Cobalt. So uh, that's uh, north of Yellowknife. So what about that uh, project in Canada? It, you, are, are you familiar with it? I'm very familiar with it. I know the geologist who wrote the 43, the original 43101, and I used to be a lawyer for the brokerage firm that the Goat family was part of. So I've known the project a long time. There we go. Um, I don't say the total production. It's just a 43101 with the resource estimate. It's gold, bismuth, and cobalt. Um, and you've got to make the gold economic to make that project work. And I see. Right, the gold isn't uh, like a load deposit or a hard rock deposit or a placer deposit. It's scattered in veins throughout the bismuth. So in my opinion, to make that work, you're gonna need an excellent mine engineer underground being able to follow the gold veins while collecting the cobalt and the uh, bismuth along the way. Thank you. You're welcome, sir, and good question. We also have another question from Paul uh, Pint. Paul, I'm going to mask your last name, so we'll just say Paul P. If um, if the critical metals are discovered in the U.S., could Trump not nationalize those mines, destroying any value for shareholders? Absolutely, absolutely, and anything is possible. You know, the, there's the United States has so many powers available to them under the various defense acts. They could certainly nationalize that. And it may may not actually be a bad thing. And the, the capitalist in me is cringing as I say that. Sometimes you've got to take the bigger picture. Okay, back to my question before, Peter. <laughs> if cobalt is going to be one of the top stocks or top uh, metals because, yeah. because of the need for electric vehicles. I mean, everybody's going electric vehicles, electric buses, electric cars, electric whatever, trucks. Yeah. Uh, they're talking electric airplanes. Uh, what else would be under with cobalt? I mean, go back a couple of years uh, when the electric vehicle like scenario started to play out. Everybody that had a gold project all of a sudden had copper, lithium, graphite, graphene, and, and every precious metal under the sun on their property. What in real realistic terms, what are the five metals that really need to be strategic? Absolutely cobalt. All of the rare earths, I realize, I think there's 12 of them, but let's lump them all together. All okay. of the rare earths are needed going forward. Uh, absolutely copper. Um, oops, something weird's happening there. There we go. Absolutely copper. Uh, copper hit a low of around $2.30 a pound. It's back up around $3.20, $3.30. And in my opinion, it has legs to run. There is so much copper needed to make the world go that the, the price has nowhere to go but up. And again, Production is down, down, down. Ex um, expiration discoveries are down. Large discoveries are down. So copper has really nowhere to go but up. So cobalt, all the rare earths, copper. Put gold and silver together. Now, gold and silver are both industrial metals. Roughly half their production is used in industry. Half is used in jewelry and uh, personal industry. Um, they both have to be included in that list. And I was shocked to see that gold wasn't on the list. And the last one would probably be manganese. Because without manganese, there is no steel industry. I realize the rust belt is still the rust belt. Steel is produced in the United States. And without steel, the country doesn't go. So you need that manganese. Under this plan in the US, has the government given any incentive it's to miners? It's not a plan yet. It's just the order that the secretaries have to do research and report back. And then the plan gets formed. Right, but okay, so if the plan were to take place, do you think that the government would put an incentive to the mining companies that have these metals on, you know, on their properties? There's lobbying going on right now in Washington from various mining companies to get that kind of support. Um, and it's probably needed. The mining industry has been abused for years. I was on an airplane in Mexico where I'm on the board of a company that's producing copper, cobalt, and uh, zinc. 
the late we flew from LA across the peninsula about a three hour flight. And the lady beside me found out I was on the board of a mining company. She tore into me. You're destroying yep. the environment. You're doing this. You're doing that. When she was done and took a breath, I walked her through the library that we built, the school we enhanced, the $30 million bond we have, the biodome that we created. So we've got cactuses and salamanders and all kinds of stuff in the biodome. And when the mine is done, they all go back and the land will be better than when we got there. By the time the flight landed three, three hours later, she was no longer quite a hater. And I think it's incumbent on all of us in the mining industry to be evangelists for the mining industry. We're doing nothing wrong. We're helping the world. We should be proud of that. Agreed. Yeah, now, Peter, one last question for me because we're running around our time zone, our time limit here. Uh, do you think that the Canadian government is gonna come up with some type of similar plan? Have you heard any rumors, any, anything going around? I haven't heard anything. Um, I haven't spoken to the good people at PDAC lately. Now, there's one group that we owe something to, it's PDAC. They work tirelessly on all our behalves, not just in Canada, but globally. They're the best known mining group in the world. Um, and I know they always have lobbying uh, efforts underway in Ottawa. Sorry, just to interrupt for a quick second, we have a uh, question again from Paul Puglioni there. I hope I said it right, Paul. Um, are there any processing facilities in Alaska for rare earths? And he's throwing it out there uh, about a new railroad being built for oil from Alaska to Alberta. Um, so are there any that you know of that are being built out there? No. None, none that I know of because th there's nothing for them to process. Okay. It would be like the tree falling in the forest. <laughs> there is talk of first cobalt getting its plant going up in cobalt, Ontario. It's a plant that ran for some years and then shut down. First Cobalt acquired it. Um, and Trent Mell, who's a wonderful guy, uh, firmly believes that they will be able to get that economically processing local Cobalt. Time will tell. Peter, this has been a very interesting uh, conversation. Much appreciated. I always like seeing you, buddy. Uh, I just want to take a second and open it up if anybody has any questions before we wrap it up with Peter here feel free to uh, raise your hand or uh, send it to us on the Q&A. Uh, if not, Peter, do you have any last uh, remarks for our uh, attendees? Don't bite on the lithium head fake. You're going to hear a lot about lithium and yes, the price will rise and then it'll fall and then it'll rise and then it'll fall. I think these solares are better sources of predictable lithium. So if you're a more conservative mining investor, go after the Solars. Um, you know, look at a company like Lithium One is doing really, really well. If you're more of a risk taker, look into Canada and other places that look to mine the lithium from the hard rock. Uh, that's a swing for the fences type of investment. If, it, if any one of them can figure out the process, you now have a world leader. Excellent. Well, on that note, Peter, thank you so much. As always. Thank you. It was great to see you. Thank you. And thank Bye you guys. to everyone who attended. We appreciate it. Thank you.